Hey guys, well I'm standing inside waiting for the darkness to come and the clouds to go. I've got the mount outside in the oven at about probably 120 degrees. And I've been using the ZWO off-axis guider lately for some imaging. And I thought I'd share with you a few of my observations on, on its use in this video. Okay, so here's the imaging train that I'll be using uh, with the ZWO off-axis guider in a couple of different configurations. Uh, first of all, this is a an old, I'll call it old, it's an ASI 120mm, not obviously not the mini version which is out now and has replaced this um, sensor or this, uh, this camera. So I'm using this camera, it's been sitting around, haven't been using it, and so this is a good opportunity to, to bring it in. Also it's got a small sensor which is about the same area as the prism or the light that comes up from the prism from the uh, from the off-axis guider so it's a good match there I'm not wasting any uh, real estate with the sensor uh, I do have a larger sensor guide camera that's the ASI 174 mini but I've paired that with my uh, Smith Cassegrain because I want as much area of a sensor as I can get with that high focal length system and I don't want to be moving that guide camera from one system to the next because you got to refocus each time you do and that can be a bit of a beating. So that's the, the idea. Um, now with this ZWO off-axis guider, there is no helical focuser. Uh, so in order to focus, this camera is screwed onto that, that fitting uh, up in here. So you've got to undo a set screw here and a smaller grub screw that acts orthogonal to that and then lift up the camera along the pillar that that has the prism in it and then you turn the set screw and reset the grub screw and then that's what holds it in place that's a bit of a fiddly operation to do at night so that's a bit of a concern with with this guider but i think i've got a workaround that that uh, seems to have worked pretty well so what i did in order to focus the system is to set the telescope up in the house focus on a nearby object get the imaging camera focused and then played around with the focus of the guide camera until I was satisfied that it also was in focus so once the two are in focus for whatever object you're pointed at whether it's near or far they should it should work as well on a guide star as it does on a glass across the uh, across the room and now let's go into Pix Insight, and I'll show you the results of that little focusing study that I did. So here is the imaging camera. Now I'm standing at one end of the house and focusing on a piece of paper that I've taped to the front door. And if we go into one-to-one uh, -one mode and then zoom in on the paper, you can see that the graph paper is fairly well uh, in focus for the imaging camera and here's the corresponding view for the guide camera now in this case it's looking off to the side right it's not going to be looking down the same axis as the imaging camera so it's seeing the door jam there's the front door and here's the wall and if we go into a one-to-one -one mode uh, on this guy we can see that for all intents and purposes the lines that we see here these contrasty lines are fairly sharp and the plaster on the wall here, the little ridges, are fairly easily detected. So that looks like it's in focus. Then I tried doing the same thing, but then focusing on a fence where the grain in the fence is provides quite a few um, details and ridges of contrast. And so you can be fairly certain that here, in this case, the imaging camera is in focus and the corresponding image from the guide camera is also in focus. Again, these lines pr provide a pretty good indicator that uh, all the detail is being captured. So this, so far, I've only set the focus by looking at the front door, and then I took the system with it being in focus and now pointed at a fence, and everything looks to still be in focus. The next thing I did was take the guide camera and imaging camera, and attach it to the 700 millimeter refractor and took it outside, set it up on a table and focused on a chimney some distance away, and maybe 200 to 300 feet away. And in this case, you can see 
this grid work of wires that surround the chimney are in pretty good focus. Actually, in this case, the imaging camera probably is not as, in, as, is as well focused as it should be or could be. But you can see a couple of the screw heads here, and if you were to zoom in well past the one-to-one -one pixel mapping that we have here, you can see it's probably, it could be a little better focus uh, than it is. But for all intents and purposes, it's in pretty decent focus. And then the corresponding image from the uh, guide camera is similarly in focus. But once again, the screws come through uh, fairly clearly. Just let's put it this way. It's e as equally out of focus as the imaging camera was, which in a weird sort of way confirms that the guide camera is focused as well as the imaging camera. So I think we're in pretty good shape. My first use of the system was with the this arrangement here attached to the 700 millimeter refractor, which is the Explore Scientific ED-102. Uh, I have the Bader click lock that holds the uh, system in, pl in place, the Explore Scientific field flattener, which requires a 55 millimeter back focus, which is important. I've got the off-axis guider at 16.5 millimeters the spacer at 11.55 millimeters and the filter wheel at 20 millimeters plus perhaps 0.5 millimeters for a, uh, a filter glass itself. And then finally, the uh, 6.5 millimeters in the uh, guide camera, in the imaging camera. And all that adds up to about 55.05 millimeters. So in theory, everything should work out with this system. So much for theory. This, this is an image I took. This is the Veil Nebula oriented in the worst possible way. It should be oriented 90 degrees relative to this so it could all fit. But this is the Eastern Veil Nebula, or at least one sub of that. The center star, uh, stars in the center of the field are fairly circular, uh, except for any guiding issues that might be going on. But I think they're fairly circular, so I think the system is certainly in focus, and I checked the focus with the Batonoff mask ahead of time. But now in the corners, and I've commented on this in previous in a previous video, the stars are not, are elongated along radial lines, which is an indication that the field is not flat. It's also an indication that tilt alone is not the issue here because tilt would not create or the symmetric arrangement of stars, of stretched stars around the uh, circumference of the field of view. Now, the reason that's important is that when I was guiding, guide stars look like this. The image that the off-axis guider provides is by definition outside the field of view of the imaging camera so it's even more close to the outer perimeter of the light cone and therefore if your field is not flat you're definitely going to see some stretched stars and that's what i was seeing so that's an unfortunate thing i i think phd2 can handle it it's doing something but i think i'd be hard pressed to say that this isn't going to be a a potential problem uh, the, the biggest thing I'd like to know, though, given that I provided the 55 millimeters of back focus, why isn't this field uh, flat? That's what I would like to know. It has nothing to do with the off-axis guider. And I have sent this information to Explore Scientific for them to provide a comment, maybe some guidance on how I can achieve a flatter field, which in turn will pay dividends in the guiding aspects of using the off-axis guider. Now, when I attach the off-axis guider to a 250 meter lens, it's a video that I'll be doing shortly uh, talking about that system. Uh, the guide star is, uh, except for some little movement that you get with guide stars, it's, it's basically circular uh, and it worked just fine. Uh, one of the things that I did notice though, both with the previous uh, configuration and with this one, when I'm using the ASI 120, that, that guide camera, it's not streaming well with PHD2 or sharp cap or fire capture or APT uh, in the mo in the mono 16 or the 16 bit mode at full resolution. Now you can cut back on the resolution and it will stream, but you don't want to cut back on the resolutions given that you're already dealing with a small chip size anyway, uh, but it will work in the 8 bit mode, which is what I have been doing. And that may be okay for a guide camera, but I'd rather have the full 16 bit. But mostly I want to know what's changed. I used to use this camera as a guide camera and I did not have a problem before. Uh, many things in my system have changed. I'm using a different computer. I'm sure the drivers themselves have been updated a number of things, but I don't know what's going on with that. So some of you have 
have encountered this problem or know a workaround or know the solution, please let me know. Now here's a t-shirt flat from the 250 millimeter scope. And what you can see here is there's an edge coming down along at an angle here. Well, what that is, if you look at how the off-axis guide camera right here is oriented relative to the sensor of the imaging camera, you can see that the axis of the prism is tilted relative to the axis of the imaging sensor and that means the base of the prism is going to follow a line right along here. So in other words, this shadow, it doesn't, not, the light is not blocked, it's just a shadow, is the shadow of the prism on this side of the imaging sensor. Now again, the flats take care of this so it's not a big deal, but that's what that little edge is. Now, what are my thoughts on this off-axis guider? Well, the pros, it's a lightweight uh, off-axis guider, so that's good. That's why I, one of the reasons I bought it, because I didn't want to attach that heavy off-axis guider I have for the Celestron on the end of the focuser tube for the refractor. So having a lightweight off-axis guider is is important, and uh, that's one reason for buying it. The off This off-axis guider is thin, which makes it possible to get to the back focus distances like 55 millimeters that I have to do for the flat fielder. Uh, element in this uh, in this imaging train. The size of the body makes that possible for the off-axis guider to be in that back focus range. Uh, this off-axis guider is well suited for short focal length telescopes because the small area prism, which means limited field of view, is best suited for a, a large field of view that comes with a shorter focal length imaging train. So I think it's probably better to use a small prism off-axis guider for these uh, shorter focal length telescopes. Now uh, the cons, some imaging trains, and mine is one of them as you can see in a previous video, uh, have or create an interference between the filter wheel and an overhanging support for the guide camera in the off-axis guider, which means that there's only one way to put the the imaging camera on relative to the off-axis guide camera, which means you can't independently set the orientation of the imaging camera for to achieve some desired framing uh, and in, independently, that is, of the guide camera's view to find a guide star. So that's another reason why you kind of want to restrict this off-axis guider to a short focal length system so that hopefully however you orient your imaging camera for framing, there'll be a guide star available for you to pick up on. Once again, not well suited for high magnification systems, and here I'm more or less arbitrarily defining a high magnification system as being one with a focal length larger than 1500 millimeters. Uh, finding a guide star is going to be difficult with a small prism, which implies small field of view, and then if you were restricted by how the um, the imaging camera is oriented relative to the guide camera. That's just another restriction. Uh, focusing can be a challenge. Uh, there's a helical focuser is, does not come with the current uh, off-axis guider. However, um, I did find that focusing on nearby objects in the daylight is uh, maybe a good workaround for any off-axis guider. And so I'm pretty pleased with those results and that may eliminate that uh, challenge in this case. Um, other issues that have nothing to do with the off-axis guider, I don't know what's happened to the ASI-120mm. It just It's not streaming at full resolution in 16-bit mode. It used to. Uh, I know that I've since switched to Windows 10. Uh, this new computer has only USB 3 connectors. Uh, maybe there have been changes to the drivers that I've downloaded. It uh, works okay in 8-bit mode, which, again, may be okay for a guide camera, but I would like to have the ability to have the full 16-bit uh, resolution if I needed it. Uh, use of off-axis guiders when the field is not flat uh, will lead to elongated guide stars. So keep that in mind. If you don't, if you have an optical system that's not a flat field, then you will have elongated guide stars. I don't know what the impact yet is on guiding, but it's certainly not going to be helpful given that the algorithm for the uh, for the get the guiding algorithm seeks to find the center of a circular star and these stars aren't circular. Uh, in conclusion, 
I like the ZWO off-axis guider. I think it's going to work great. I've been trying it out for the past couple of days uh, on my 700 and 250 millimeter scopes, and uh, I don't have uh, any issues. I highly recommend the, the ZWO off-axis guider if you can uh, find an application within the pros and cons that I've mentioned. I think you'll be, uh, be in, in pretty good shape. All right, thanks for watching.